Felix of Cantalice, May 18th. Confessor, First Order. In the Italian village of Cantalice, in the beautiful valley of Rieti, Felix was born of humble but pious peasants. As a boy, he tended cattle, and later he became a farm laborer. Being so much amid God's free nature, his heart was attracted to God, whose gracious ministering to us human beings he had daily before his eyes. Neither did the hard work make him coarse and worldly-minded, as sometimes happens, but he was gentle and kind towards everyone. When he came home, when he came home at night all tired out, he still spent much time in his little room engaged in prayer, to which, for that matter, he applied himself also while at work. It grieved him that he could not attend Holy Mass on weekdays. He would indeed gladly have consecrated his whole life to the service of God, but he could see no way of carrying out his desire until one day an accident showed him the way. <clears throat> Felix had to break to the plow a team of young oxen that were very wild. The oxen shied, and when Felix tried to stop them, they ran him down, dragging the sharp plowshare across his body. Peasants ran to the scene, certain that they would find the man dead, but Felix arose unharmed, with only his jacket rent. But he went straight to his employer and begged to be released from his service. The little he possessed he gave to the poor, and went to the nearest Capuchin convent, where he humbly begged for admission. After careful trial, his request was granted. Now Felix felt like one newly born, as if heaven itself had opened to him. It was in the year 1543, and Felix was 28 years old. But in his novitiate, he was yet to experience the burden and the struggles of this earthly life. The devil attacked him with violent temptations of all kinds. He was also seized with a lingering illness, which made it appear that he was unfit for convent life. But patience, steadfast self-control, prayer, and candor towards his superiors helped him secure admission to the vows, which he took with great delight. Soon afterwards, he was sent to the Capuchin convent at Rome, where, because of his genuine piety and friendly manner, he was appointed to the task of gathering alms, which he did for all the next 42 years until his death. With his provision sack slung over his shoulder, he went about so humbly and, reser and reserved in manner that he, that he edified everybody. When he received an alms, he had so cordial a way of saying Deo gratias, thanks be to God, that the people called him Brother Deo gratias. As soon as he got back to the convent and delivered the provisions, he found his way to church. There he first said a prayer for the benefactors. Then he poured out his heart in devotion, especially before the Blessed Sacrament and at the altar of Our Lady. There he also passed many hours of the night, and one time the Mother of God placed the Divine Child in the arms of the overjoyed Felix. He was most conscientious in observing every detail of his rule and vows. He did not wait for the orders of his superiors. A mere hint from them was enough. Although always in touch with the world, he kept such careful guard over his chastity in every word and look that Pope Paul V said he was a saint in body and soul. Poverty was his favorite virtue. Because our Holy Father, St. Francis, forbade his friars to accept money in any form, Felix could not be prevailed upon to accept it under, under any circumstances. How pleasing this spirit was to God was to be proved in a remarkable way. Once, on leaving a house, Felix slung his sack over his shoulder, but felt it weigh so heavily 
that it almost crushed him. He searched the sack and found a coin which someone had secretly slipped into it. He threw it away in disgust and cheerfully and easily took up his sack again. Almighty God granted Felix extraordinary graces. Many sick persons he restored to health with the sign of the cross. A dead child he gave back alive to its mother. In the most puzzling cases, he was able to give helpful advice. Honored by the great and the lowly, he considered himself the most wretched of men, but earned so much the more merits with God. Finally, the day arrived when Felix was to gather the hoard of his merits. He died with a cheerful countenance while catching sight of the Mother of God, who invited him to the joys of paradise. It was on the Feast of Pentecost, May 18, 1587. Pope Urban VIII beatified him. Pope Clement XI inscribed him in the Register of the Saints in 1709. On the Use of Money For love of poverty in the highest degree and recognizing the dangers to Christian perfection usually connected with money, St. Francis forbade his friars to accept money as Christ himself wished his disciples not to carry money about with them. Matthew 10, verse 9. We behold in the life of St. Felix how agreeable to God is the faithful observance of this precept of St. Francis, wherever that is possible. But there are instances when no Christian may accept money. That would be the case if anyone were to offer money in order to make you do wrong or be unfaithful to your duty. Solomon complained among the Jews, quote, All things obey money. End quote. Ecclesiasticus 10.19 Must this complaint not be applied to Christians too? To such who accept money for sordid reasons, as well as to such who give it, the curse of Peter, the prince of the apostles, applies. Let your money perish with you. Acts 8.20 have you perhaps reason to fear this curse? Consider that to acquire the necessities of life, money is something very useful. And as civil life is today, one cannot do without it. But it must be used in the right way. That is why it should not be given freely to such who are apt to abuse it, such as children or shiftless needy people. It is better to give such persons the things they need than the ready money. Neither may we ourselves spend it wastefully or squander it, because God will require an account of the way we spend our money. But it should serve for necessary expenses for ourselves and our charges in accordance with our position in life. The father of a house, for example, must cheerfully provide the necessary money so that his wife and children are not driven to tell lies and to steal. Money should also be applied, according to one's means, to help relieve the needs of others as well as to promote good purposes and to further the welfare of the church and the honor of God. Fortunate is he who uses his money thus. Have you always used it well? Consider that it is not wrong to lay aside a quantity of money for times of need. A wise proverb reads, Save in time, and you will have something in the day of need. But be on your guard, lest saving should breed love for money, a thing that can readily happen. In that case, economy would not save you from distressful experience, but would rather increase the chance, since he who loves money sets even his soul to sale. Ecclesiasticus 10.10 Therefore, it is well not to be too saving, but to rely upon God. 
Should, for example, a particular need arise to help your neighbor, then with the confidence of a child, use your savings for him as willingly as for your own need. Since Jesus Christ teaches, love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12:31. Prayer of the Church. Make us, Lord Jesus, walk in the innocence and simplicity of our hearts, since for love of these virtues thou didst descend from the bosom of thy mother into the arms of blessed Felix, thy confessor, who livest and reignest forever and ever. Amen.